Good, old, good, good morning, good afternoon, good evening. I'm not sure in which time zone uh, you are now. Uh, my name is Enrique Urrutia. Uh, I'm from Chile. I've been a food safety auditor for about 20 years and an auditor for Primo GFS since version 1.6, the very first one. Uh, and also I'm an approved trainer by ASUL, so I can do official Primo GFS training, but this is not an official training. The official training is a three-day seminar, you know, the very long one. Anyway, uh, the purpose of this webinar, uh, today we're going to review all the changes, you know, or the transition from Prime GFS from version 2.1-2C, the very last revision of version 2, to version 3, revision 1, okay? We're going to touch bases uh, with the program regulations. I'm going to show you some of the new regulations were important to you to keep in mind, yeah? Uh, module one, the food safety management system, all the new requirements, the new questions, and in the GMPs, HACCP and preventive controls, module five, six, and seven, the same, yeah? Uh, the truth is, there's no major surgery in the standard, you know? It's, there's no too many new questions. There's new questions and redesign of some of them, but there's no, you know, uh, significant in-depth changes if we compare this against version 2.1, especially in module five, the GMPs. There's some new questions mostly related with water, yeah, in wash steps, etc., and some requirements that probably are going to sound very familiar for you because they're part of other standards or are part of other modules, yeah, like, Question who came from the harvest crew to the facility. Just give me, let me give you an example. Drinking water. Uh, in primary GFS, we have question about drinking water for the workers in the farm module, formerly known as ranch, in the greenhouse, in the harvest crew, but we didn't have that question in the GMPs. So now they put that question in the GMPs. Yeah. Uh, Jorge, I have a question from Jorge. At what time uh, this webinar start? Uh, now it started. Yeah. <laughs> We're on it. Okay, timeframes and transition period for version three, revision one and revision two. Well, revision uh, version three becomes available for certification bodies and audits, you know, in August 6, 2018, yeah? But currently version three, revision zero and version three, revision one coexist until January 15, 2020, yeah? So is your call from now up to January 15, to choose which one of the versions you're going to use. Now, the thing is, there's no new question in, in between re, the version three, revision zero, and revision one. It's mostly clarifications. So really, there's no big differences. Maybe the most important thing that we can, you know, address on this concern is we have some new guidelines or new clarifications in the section microbiological testing, yeah? Uh, we have some metrics to consider, yeah, in revision one. Metrics that we didn't have, you know, we don't have in revision zero, yeah? And version three, revision one, becomes mandatory from January 16, 2020. So from January 16, 2020, the only revision or version that you can use is revision 3.1. Uh, important to know that all the normative documents in English and Spanish are posted in the Primo GFS website. So there's the, 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 the link is there, but it's very easy to find them. Just Google it, Primo GFS, and the first finding in any browser will be Primo GFS. You click in documents and there you will see them. But for revision one, version three, we, uh, ASUL has still not released the interpretation guidelines. So we have the classic documents, you know, for, a, for any version and revision, the program rules, the checklist, the, the question and expectation, that is a kind of brief explanation of the expectation of compliance against each one of the question in the standard. But the, the very important document, the big one, the one who has the in-depth explanations, you know, of the compliance criteria, the guideline for every one of the questions in revision 3.1 is still not available in the website. I think that is going to be ready very soon. So at this time, you can use as a reference, you know, the interpretation guidelines, you know, for uh, version 3, revision 0, yeah? New Primo GFS structure for the people structure for the people who was used to use version 2.1. Probably you remember that we had three modules: module one, the food safety management system; module two, that was divided in GAPs, ranches, greenhouses, and harvest crews; uh, module two, GMPs, and then module three, that was HACCP. Well, they redesigned this, and now we have seven modules. 
Uh, first, we have module one, the food safety management system that, you know, is as in the past, module number one. Then in the GAPs, we have three modules. Module two, the farm module, formerly known as ranch in version 2.1. Module three, indoor agriculture, and formerly known as the greenhouse module or part of the audit in version 2.1. And module four, the harvest crew. And in the GMPs, here we have the three new modules in terms of identification of them. Module five, the facility module or GMP module, all the questions related with the good manufacturing practices, the very long checklist, yeah. Module six, HACCP, that don't forget that is still mandatory for all the facilities. Even if you don't have cri uh, critical control points, that modules apply. At least you know the first section, everything related, you know the flow diagram, risk assessment, competence of the HACCP coordinator and the HACCP team, etc. And we have a brand new module, module seven, the preventive control, as you know, the outcome of the, the uh, FISMA regulations that will be, that is optional for facilities. So is your call to include that module or not through your application process? But keep that with something in mind. This is not just to apply for this to see how it goes during the inspection. You need to be prepared because don't forget one rule to achieve certification you need to achieve after corrective action at least a 90% of compliance, you know, our overall compliance considering all the modules of the checklist. But also you need to achieve at least an 85% of compliance per module. So if you're not pre prepared for the preventive control modules and you don't do a good job, you know, during the inspection, potentially your audit could fail. Yeah? So keep that in mind. Changes to the regulations. There's a few changes, you know, who applies for the LDT, yeah? There's a lot of new regulations for the certification bodies. So in the next part of the webinar, I'm going to present the most important changes or new stuff in the program regulations that are important for you as the LDT, you know, that you should be aware of them, yeah? Okay, the first change, that's something that looks not so complicated, but could have very important consequences in your audit process. Application process, country of destination per commodity. In the form, or you know, provided by your certification body, or when you upload your application registration for the audit in version three, you're going to, to need to identify if you intend to sell the product in any foreign market? Well, people say, yes, I can put the whole world if I want, but this is going to have consequences. You need to be prepared, why? Because it's very common, for example, the section of the audit at facility level who does not apply, you know, uh, when there's a scenario such that makes them not applicable. For example, the allergen section. If you're not handling, you know, running, packing, storing any allergen, you know, considering the list of allergen of the US, all that section is about 12 questions goes to NA. But the problem or the concern is, what about if you include foreign markets, you know, external countries of destination, let's say uh, Germany. Well, uh, allergens are not, you know, the same for all the world. That's a, uh, each country has their own list of allergens. So I'm gonna tell, I'm gonna give you a, a classic, you know, example of applicability of the allergen section because of foreign markets. Celery. If you're running celery in your facility and you apply only for the United States for your inspection, no concern with celery in terms of allergens. So it's, I'm not go, the auditor is not going to make applicable the allergen section. But if you declare through your application that you're going to export the product for Germany, oops. Celery is in the list of allergens of the European community, the European Union. Union. So that's going to trigger the whole applicability of that section. So keep in mind that if you put any foreign country, you need to be prepared, for example, knowing which are the, you know, the list of allergens of those countries. Yeah. The same with MRLs. What about if you're doing, you know, post-harvest application, let's say applying a fungicide? Uh, if you're applying just to sell to the United States following the labor recommendations, you're enough, you, it's enough to, to prove compliance against the MRLs of the United States if you observe, if you follow those recommendations. But probably if you are exporting the product to a country where the MRLs are more strict than in the US, it's not enough, you know, to prove compliance with the MRLs following the label. 
So probably you're going to need to do some product testing to prove that at least the shipments who goes to those countries are in compliance with the emeralds of the countries of destination, if they're more strict than the ones in the United States. Another new rule. You have now the option to apply for your audit as announced or unannounced. Yeah? Now, if you decide to take the path of the unannounced audit by your own decision or because your buyer is pushing for that, uh, <coughs> the rules are uh, you're going to be notified of the audit date two working days before the inspection. If you not accept the first attempt, I'm sorry, the audit will be rescheduled for a further date, but will be conducted as announced. So you're going to lose the chance to have in your certificate and in your audit report, the explanation, the reference that the audit was conducted and announced. Yeah? Now, if you accept the unannounced audit, because you apply for that and you accept, you know, the first date proposed by the certification, by your certification body, the audit report and certificate, if you achieve the certification, of course, will display this condition, unannounced. Let me see if there's any questions. Okay, no questions. Hmm. Tom says, keeps cutting in and out. Hey, uh, I'm going to do a small parenthesis. Any of you still having problems with the connection? By default. So answer only if you have problems with a yes. I'm looking for the chat. No? Okay. Tom, probably is your browser or your speed connect, your internet speed. Okay. No, no, no. Okay. So I'm sorry. But anyway, uh, this, this webinar is being recorded and you're going to receive a copy of this so you can enjoy my nice international accent as many times as you want. Okay. A new regulation. Surveillance audit. This is only applicable for people certified, for operations certified under version 3. So if you have a current certificate under version 2, forget this rule. Don't forget that this is a new regulation in version 3. Uh, certification bodies shall conduct surveillance audits for their certified operation. What is a surveillance audit? It's exactly as your official audit, but the purpose is not to achieve certification. It's just to check to assure that your program is running as should be. Now, if you don't do a good job in your surveillance audit, your certifi certificate could be suspended. Uh, the rules are the same. You need to achieve an 85% of compliance per module and an overall score after corrective action of at least 90%. Ideally, each certification body should conduct surveillance audits for the 2% of the certified operations under version 3. Now, the selection of these, you know, operations to be inspected under the surveillance program is not a random selection. It should be based on risk, on risk assessment approach. For example, your compliance history. If your audit, your operation, you know, did a good job during the audit with few or known, you know, issues that reduce your chances as opposite if you had many, too many uh, non-compliances, yeah? Uh, the same if uh, chances increase to be selected for a surveillance audit, if the certification body or the standard owner receive a complaint about you, for example, a buyer complaining about you uh, with the certification uh, body or with the scheme owner. The scheme owner is a tool. If they receive a complaint, they're going to forward that complaint to us, yeah? If you're involved in a recall, or even worse, in an outbreak, oh, if you're involved in an outbreak, I can sign here that you are going to be chosen for a surveillance audit, yes or yes. Yeah? Other facts to consider is the risk of the process and the product. For example, if you grow romaine lettuce, ah, probably you have more chances to be selected for the surveillance audit than a producer who is not growing romaine lettuce. Why? Because the last year we have events of outbreaks caused by uh, romaine lettuce. So, it's a high-risk product based on historical events. The rules are, you will be notified two working days before the audit. You have the right to reject the first attempt, but under justifiable reason, not because you're tired or even worse, I'm in the top of the season. No, it's, that's not a good reason, you know, to, uh, to reject the uh, surveillance audit. Could be because you're out of town, you're sick, wherever. Yeah, but not because you're in the top of the season. In fact, if you say that you're in the top of the season, the peak of the season, oh yeah, we would love to conduct, you know, as a certification body, the audit during that period because it's the most representative representative 
period of the season, you know, of your food safety program. Now, if you reject with a good reason the first attempt, the the uh, certification body must follow up this and propose a second attempt. The problem is if you as if you reject the second attempt, the certificate will be suspended. Yeah, and this is not certification body rules. These are primal GFS regulations. Other changes to regulations. Uh, this is related with non-conformances and corrective action. The very first one uh, is brand new in version three. For all non-conformances, that means any question that was applicable and scoring total non-conformance, in other words, you made zero points in that question, will be mandatory to submit corrective actions. Now, in some cases, it's not possible by technical, by uh, uh, economic resources to implement that corrective action. Let's say that you receive a downscore because your food contact packaging is stored in an open area not in an enclosed, you know, storage. Uh, probably the cost of that corrective action is not, could be not possible for you to implement that. But even that, you need to make reference in the corrective action process in how you mitigate that risk. For example, in this scenario, you can make reference that all the packaging material is, you know, off the floor, over pallets, properly, you know, covered with plastic, that you have a pest control program in place. Uh, of course, the corrective action will be not accepted because in this scenario, in that specific question, the requirement is to have a enclosed storage for that. But at least you're showing what are you doing to mitigate food safety risk. Yeah. The second one that I highlight in red. Why I highlight in red? This will be crucial in your corrective action process. I mean in your, your corrective action process with your certification body. The corrective action should include the determination of the costs, the action plan to address immediately the issue, the corrective action, so that means, okay, I fix the problem and what I'm doing to prevent this from happening again, and also the measures to assess if the corrective action implemented was sufficient. So let me give you an example. During the inspection, yeah, uh, your facility, your packing house, your processing facility, wherever. The auditor observed three workers not washing their hands after user restaurants. Okay, that's a deviation probably. The auditor will decide to score between a minor or a, or a major in regards to your hand washing practices. In the past, was almost enough to send a training record for, this, for these three workers and usually Auditors were accepting that. Now that will not be enough. To recover back all the points that you lost, you know, because that deviation or non-conformance, you need to first document the determination of the cost, why that happens, explain the corrective action, submit the evidence of the corrective action, and how you're going to follow up to assess if that corrective action was properly implemented and efficient. In other words, that the same problem is not happening again. So if we go back to this example, this is a scenario, you know, three workers not washing their hands. What about if you start, you know, checking the why the, this happens? You can use the root cause analysis, the Ishikawa or phone beast diagram, or the best tool that you have for this, your common sense. What about if you start reviewing the training record for the three workers that were noted without washing their hands, and you see, you catch that there's multiple training records for them, including, you know, the hand washing practices and policies. So do you think that another training is going to resolve the problem? The problem? No. Nope. Maybe the problem is other, lack of supervision, or even worse. Those workers are not competent to follow those instructions. So the corrective action maybe will not be a retraining. Maybe it will be a retraining for the supervisors or even, you know, to let them go. Um, I mean, you know, these three workers are not competent to follow hygiene policies set by your company. Yeah? This will be crucial in your corrective action process. If you don't document this, you're not going to receive full point backs. Yeah? Even could be even re fully rejected your corrective action. Now, is this new? No. Do you remember in the FSMS in version 2.1? In all, well, since version 1.6, the very first one, we have a specific question in the food safety management system about your corrective action procedure, your SOP and how to deal with issues 
Yeah. So really, this is the implementation of that SOP. And in the past, several auditors were, you know, downscoring against the SOP if you were not, you know, including all these steps in the uh, process of your corrective actions. Yeah. But now, no. Now this is pointing in a specific each one of the corrective actions that you submit. So don't forget this. If you want to recover all point backs, you know, through your corrective action process, you need to pay attention and document this. The other thing that is not new, but now is clearly explained in the program regulations. Any inspection who achieved less than 85% at the day of the audit, that means the preliminary report before corrective actions, if it's less than 85, that means 84.99999 period, uh, you have the right to submit corrective actions and the auditor have the duty to review them. But even if all of them accepted, the scores are not going to change and the audit will fail. And this is something that is controlled by a sole system, Primo GFS website. They have a system. Even if, if I do an audit for any of you and you finish with an 84% and you send me the best corrective actions of the world and I accept all of them, even that, the final report will show 84%. By that, the audit will not achieve certification because you need an overall score of at least 90%. This is out of our control. This is controlled by default by Prime GFS uh, reporting system. Okay, let me see if there's any question. Okay, no questions. Sanctions. There's two types of sanctions to certify operation. The first one is suspension. The first case, and makes a lot of sense, if a subsequent or recertification audit results in an automatic failure and you still have a valid certificate for that operation, by this rule, first you're going to fail the current, the current audit and also we need to suspend, you know, the current certificate. Why? Makes a lot of sense. An automatic failure means a serious food safety concern, you know, a serious food safety finding in your operation. So, of course, it's just common sense to think, yes, the current certificate for that operation should be suspended too. Well, several certification bodies were doing that, but now it's written in the program rules. The other cause of a suspension is if you don't pay the bill. If you don't pay, you know, the cost, you know, the invoice given by your certification body, the certification body has the right to suspend your certification. And something important, people think, okay, I have my certificate here. I have my certificate. I can show that to my buyers. But because a GFSI requirement, all the GFSI standard must have a system to check the validity of the certificate. So in the Prime GFS website, there is a link, there is a section where you can check you know, if a specific certificate, if a, if a specific operation has still a valid certificate or not, okay? Okay, here I have a comment by Tom, then why perform the corrective actions? Uh, Tom, probably you're referring when you have a total non-compliance or non-conformance in a, in, in a, against a question uh, and you're not able to resolve that. Well, we can spend the rest of the day talking about the why. Yeah, but don't forget something. All the rules of this program has been placed by uh, the standard owner, Azul. We, as a certification body, me, as a trainer, I'm just the messenger. Yeah, I have to admit that several times I have that type of comments, you know, not just for Prime GFS, for several different certification standards. But at the very end, the one who put the rules is the standard owner. We just follow them. And we say, when I say we, is me as an auditor, as a certification body, and you as an auditee. Yeah? Now, other reason for a suspension, if you reject a surveillance audit for the second time, yeah, we spoke about that. Now, there's another type of sanction. A suspension could escalate to a revocation. This is a serious sanction. The first reason for a revocation, if the cause of a suspension is not resolved in the time set by your certification body. When we issue as a certification body a suspension, together with the automatic email that you receive from the you know, Prime GFS website, we should, you know, any certification body should follow up with a letter, an email, explaining the reason of the suspension and giving you a time frame to resolve that the, the cause of that suspension. Even more. If you resolve that suspension, the cost of that suspension could be possible even to lift the suspension and reinstate the certification cycle or the certificate for that operation. Let's say that uh, you forgot to pay the invoice. Yeah, uh, you receive a suspension, 
And after one month, you decide to pay the invoice of that audit. So the cost of the suspension has been resolved. If you did that in the time set set by your certification body to resolve that problem, it's fine. So you are going to receive back your certification and that will be, you know, posted again as certified in the Prime GFS uh, website. Now, if you don't resolve the suspension in the time frame set by the uh, certification body, I'm sorry, you go over a revocation. Other cost for revocations is if you are, you know, uh, found making fraud or if you go to bankrupt. Now, if a company goes to bankrupt, <laughs> there's no certificate needed, yeah? Now, the, what is the main difference in between, in between a suspension and a revocation? If you receive such type of sanction a revocation, you're out of the game for six months. In other words, counting from the day of when the revocation was imposed, your company, your operation cannot apply for certification with any certification body for six months. And don't forget that all this information uh, is kept in the Prime GFS database. So if you decide to change certification body, when the other certification body is dealing with, you know, the acceptance of your application, oh, the system is going to say, no, 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 these people is under a revocation. So there's no way to, you know, uh, go by the side with this revocation using other certification body, yeah? Uh, okay, let me see if there's any question about this regulation. Okay, and just something to keep in mind. This is just a summary of the most important news things that applies for the LDTs in the regulation. But I highly encourage you to read the program regulation. It's just 24 pages. If you have problems to sleep, oh, it's going to help you a lot. Uh, and don't forget something. The same with the complete interpretation guidelines when they are released, you know. I'm just giving you a summary of the most important changes, but there's a lot of details. And some of details could mean something that needs to be updated in your program if you were using in the past Prime GFS version 2.1. Okay, let's go with module one, food safety management system. Really? Not too many new stuff here. Some of the new stuff was implicit in existing requirements or guidelines uh, in version 2.1, but there's a few new things, you know, some of them, you know, not so complicated to comply. Other ones, ooh, maybe could be a little complicated in terms of time to invest on them. The first one, there should be a training management system in place that show what type of trainings are required for various job roles and specific workers. I'm going to stop there. This is not new. In version 2.1, we have several questions about training program. What is a training program? A training program defines what type of training, when, and who should receive that. So really, there's no new stuff here. Yeah. But the second part is new, including who has been trained, when they were trained, which training they still need to take, and a training schedule. So in other words, you need to have a way to track and demonstrate this in the inspection, the level of implementation of your training program. In a small company, let's say a small, you know, blueberry packer with 10 workers in the San Joaquin Valley, probably just showing the training record will be very easy to track the, you know, the level of implementation of your training program. But what about if you have 200 workers, the training records are not going to work. So uh, the standard, as an example, propose a training matrix. Yeah, you can use spreadsheets, you know, um, maybe one or two, one, you know, explaining the training program, different type of roles, you know, in the company related with food safety, of course, what type of trainings they need, and then you cross match them, identifying, you know, which trainings they need. Now, the second part will be have something similar, showing per worker, not per group of worker, per worker, the level of implementation of that program. So if you have 200 workers in your facility, I'm sorry, the training records are not going to be able to work to demonstrate that you are able to track the level of implementation of your program. Yeah. So in that case, you're going to need to have uh, a documented method to prove that, like a training matrix. Yeah. But the key is to track persons, individuals, not groups, because you can say, okay, I train all my workers in the facility. My next question as an auditor, do you hire all of them at the same time? No, Enrique, I received a couple of new guys, you know, two weeks ago. Well, I need to see, you know, when they were trained, uh, you know, which training are still pending for them. You know what I mean? This is a specific for worker. Again, a training matrix could work good for this. Now, means work. Yeah. 
Next question is probably in several cases will be not applicable. In some cases could be applicable, but it's very easy. I'm going to do a brief preamble. You remember that Prime Jafet, since the very first version, make reference that in case that exists any regulation or industry guidelines that applies to your crop or your process, and those guidelines, you know, are more strict, more demanding against any re requirement in the Prime Jafet checklist. Those guidelines override that expectation. Uh, for example, if I'm growing strawberries in Chile, Chile has a specific, you know, industry guideline for raspberries. In fact, it's a law. Uh, they should be able to prove that the water used for pre-harvest water, for irrigation or for contact water, should meet the drinking water standards. If we compare that regulation against uh, the primary GFS metrics, who refers to less than 235 E. coli, yeah, uh, of course, the Chilean regulation is more demanding, so that's override. So when I'm auditing in Chile, I have to look for evidence that any water application in contact with the product 30 days prior to harvest, must there should be evidence that the water meets the EPA drinking water standards. Yeah. And note what I told you, EPA drinking water standards. And that's a mistake, should be the specific regulation of Chile that makes reference to that. Yeah. Sorry, I extrapolate, you know, countries. But that's the deal. Well, going back to this question, if your process or your product falls uh, under any specific industry guidelines like LGMA for leafy green producers in Yuma, Arizona, you should have a copy of that, you know, industry guideline. In this question, the only thing that you should do is show the copy in a hard copy or the access through the internet uh, to your inspector, to your auditor, to be in compliance. So not so complicated. And again, if there's no specific industry guideline for your process or your crop, this question is not applicable for you. Easy to understand, but in some certain cases could give you a lot of work, the following new question. All records and test results who are related with food safety, of course, it's a food safety audit, must be reviewed and signed off by the person responsible for the food safety person. Now, so what means this? Any type of records, in this case, at, at manufacturing practices, yeah, uh, like cleaning records, uh, like uh, lab testing, MRLs, calibration, trainings, all of them must be reviewed by the designated person. And who is or who are that designated person or people? People competent to review them, people who can understand what they're reviewing. Yeah. So, uh, as a tip, this could be a nice, you know, idea to approach with the food safety committee. Yeah. Let's say that you said be weekly meetings where all the records generated in the last two weeks are on the table. And based on expertise, you know, the uh, food safety coordinator divide the work in between. All the team that could be acceptable now uh, i have a comment from in another training of a company who told me enrique we have over you know 1000 records per week in between cleaning in between training in between applications wherever well all of them must be reviewed and signed off something to keep in mind when you sign off something you're assuming liability what about if you're sign just only signing them if you sign a record and i see that it's signed i'm going to accept it but the thing is, what about if there's information in that record that could be used later if you have an outbreak, for example? Let's say a test showing that you have problems with the water that you use to perform your cleaning activities in the facility or to wash product. And then after there's an outbreak, uh -uh. so think about that, yeah? Again, the requirement is, is just to review and the evidence of compliance will be, will be signing, sign, signing them off. Uh, I've seen creative ways to deal with this. I've seen people that instead, you know, to sign the document itself, they have a list of a, a log explaining which records they review. Uh, but of course, there should be a linking in between that list and the document itself. For example, the name of the document and the date when it was completed. Yeah. Any questions so far? Give me just one second. I just dropped something here. Okay. Next question. The following one is not a new question. 
O sea, it's a new question, but it's not a new requirement. If you remember in version 2.1, we have a question about calibration, you know, in module one. But that question also at the very end of the guidelines make, made reference that there should be records of those verifications and or calibrations. Now, PrimoGFS split this in two questions, the calibration SOP and the record of calibration. I'm going to use another word, verification. Just a parenthesis, verification against calibration. Uh, the first step when you're when you're uh, measuring any measuring device to see if it's accurate is a verification. For example, I can you know check an ORP meter is in a buffer solution to see if the readings of that or or ORP meter show that it's an accurate reading. Now the thing is when a verification shows that an equipment is out of range. Yeah, there's two ways to deal with this. Calibrating the equipment if it's possible, like an ORP meter, like a dial thermometer, or disposing off. In other words, throw into the trash that equipment. Let's say that we're talking about the facility, the cold rooms, water thermometers. Usually those equipments are, are not able to be calibrated. So if they're not measuring accurately, uh, the corrective action is to replace them. You're not able to calibrate them. Yeah. Going back to this, things to keep in mind. Uh, in the question about the calibration SOPs, the guidelines make reference that you need to have a, a list identifying all the equipment that should be, you know, subject of this requirement of calibration. Second, you need to have the specific SOP showing, you know, the method, the frequency, and something very important, your acceptable range of variation. For example, we're talking about thermometer is very, thermometers, it's very common that a uh, plus one, minus one Fahrenheit degree, degree is it still acceptable. That makes sense. Now, if you put plus 10, minus 10, ah, no, that's not going to work. And then the SOP should explain the method, you know, which is the steps to follow for this verification and when applicable calibration. Now, in the recording size of, the, you know, this requirement, there should be records identifying the specific device that was verified, the outcome of that verification, and based on that, the corrective action. The corrective action, again, could be, a new equipment, water thermometers, or a calibration of this, the, the equipment, the RP meter, yeah? Make sense? Any question, folks? Let me see the chat. Okay, Let, let's move to the next one. New question. Food fraud vulnerability assessment. The first thing that I'm going to tell you, this is not biodefense, no. This is something different. I could have some pointers of encounter, but it's a different requirement. So your biodefense or biosecurity program is not going to work for this. This uh, new requirement is looking for a risk assessment to uh, analyze, to assess if there's any significant risk in terms of food fraud. For example, if you're buying uh, sanitation chemicals, uh, how you can assure that what is inside of the container is really what they, what the supplier, you know, say it is. Yeah. Now, I have a, a picture that can give you an idea of what is looking for this. Yeah. Now, in the scope of this, this includes any uh, fraud motivated by economic reason. For example, adding water for a sanitizer, for a cleaner, uh, economically motivated food safety hazard. Adulterated substances. I've seen not in the produce industry, but in other food industries, you know, how people use, for example, corn powder to increase, you know, the volume of, uh, how you call it? Paprika. I'm not sure the name in English. But anyway, they're adding something extra that looks the same as the product that you're buying, but is not, you know, pure as should be. Tampering simulation, diversion or gray market, intellectual, intellectual property rights and counterfeiting. What do you should consider as a base, you know, for this, you know, assessment and mitigation plan? Chemicals, uh, fertilizers, plant protection products, packaging materials, uh, post-harvest, you know, fungicides, etc. Look at Coca-Cola bottle. I'm going to extrapolate this for, for the field part of the standard. This picture, I took this picture of that Coca-Cola bottle uh, in, a, um, in a pesticide storage in South America. And the label refers Paraquat. So my question was to the producer, how you can assure that it's Paraquat? Maybe it's a different chemical. Maybe it's Paraquat, but the supplier dilute this with water. 
So a good idea could be, <laughs> Hector, that is paraquat. <laughs> yeah, the producer told me the same. Yeah. <laughs> but the thing is, you can make reference to know with your mitigation plan for such type of concern through your supply monitoring program. Maybe, for example, for all type of, you know, incoming material from your suppliers, you make reference to formal suppliers, sealed containers, properly labeled. That's that type of things. Yeah. And also, this risk assessment should consider the outgoing, the shipping of the product. Uh, I'm going to give you a funny example. In Chile, my country, your shipping product from your packing house to the grocery, to the retailer, to an exporting company, that probably is a couple of four hours away from your packing house. But the truck driver decides to stop at his girlfriend's house and then at his family house. And say, folks, my dear friends, grab wherever you want, free products for you, free blueberries. That's, you know, economic, economic fraud. So that, those are the things that you need to keep in mind. Now, in Chile, for example, based on this type of, you know, problems, it's very common to track, you know, through GPS, you know, the path of this, the, 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 the track. So they can assure that the guy is not, the driver is not going to other places other than where he should go, yeah, where he should go. Now, uh, it depends. This is just an example. Uh, based on risk, if the risk is very low, you can make reference, for example, uh, that to mitigate the risk of fraud, you know, related with shipping, that you are recording the plate of the truck and the name of the driver. The mitigation measures are related with the potential risk. Yeah. Now, if you Google it, you're going to find a lot of food fraud, you know, uh, templates to use. Some of them very complex, other ones very easy to use. Your call. Yeah. But again, the best tool that you have is your common sense and your knowledge of your product, your process and the industry where you're working. Yeah. And the last new question, but new, not new requirement in module one. Uh, this is a question related with the food defense, the biosecurity plan. If you remember in version 2.1, we have only one question. There should be a risk assessment, you know, for biosecurity. That was very common, you know, to identify one of the most important risks in terms of biosecurity is people, visitors, the workers, you know, contractors. And one of the things that I've seen many times, you know, in the risk assessment and in the mitigation plan is training in biosecurity or food defense for the workers. Okay, perfect. So when you put that in a risk assessment, I expect to see those records, but that was not literally written, not in written in the guidelines. It's just implicit. Now we have a new question, this one. Records associated with the food defense plan should be available for review. For example, if your food defense plans make reference to training for all the facility workers in biosecurity, uh, when I'm going over this question, may I see those records, please? Really, not a new requirement, only a new question. And that's all for module one. As you see, no major surgery. Maybe in big company, the most complicated thing will be the review of the all the records and lab test results. Um, yeah, it's going to take you some time. That's going to take your time. Yeah, but don't forget, it's not, could be more than one person. The keys, the people doing that should be competent, should understand what are they reviewing. Yeah. Okay. More, no, let me see if there's any question in, for module one. Someone else is confirming again that that Coca Cola bottle is paraquat. <laughs> okay. Let's move to module five. Module five, no major surgery. Just a preamble, module five is divided since you know the very first version in two sections. It's not literally written, but it's just to see it. To see it. The first part of the checklist is based on the facility tool. Oh, but that means visuals. You observe the equipment, you observe the people, uh, you check A, B or C, but all everything is based on visual. And the second part of the checklist in the GMPs is only documents. Yeah. In the first part, really, there's almost nothing new, a couple of new requirements. Uh, there's a few new things, you know, in the documental part. Yeah. 
Uh, preamble. Some questions and expectation has been expanded to clarify the compliance, the compliance criteria. That is good. Yeah? So we have a better interpretation guidelines, you know, explaining better, giving us more examples in how to deal with each one of the uh, question of the checklist. The section testing. Section testing is where, the, as I see, the most important change in the module 5 of the GMP module. Several new questions. Really nice work by Azul in this section. Yeah, they did a really good job. Yeah, I like what they put. And something very interesting is moving a lot of responsibilities in regards of what to do uh, in your testing section. You know, swaps, products, water, etc. To your decision. We still have some minimums, but it's moving a lot of the responsibilities of decision to you. And when I say to you, please don't think in what the author expects to see. Working something that fits, that is worthy for your operation. If you use that approach, by default, you should be okay with the, uh, with the inspection. Not too many questions considering the length of this module. This is the most longest part of the, or the longest module when we're doing a facility. Okay, the following section we're going to talk about the new stuff from question 50101 to 51020 the facility tour really i told you that everything is based on visuals but there's two quest two questions that i'm not sure why i solely put them here related with documents some maps some drawings that you will need to do yeah but all the rest is based on visuals observing the equipment observing the peoples you know doing their job observing the buildings etc Okay, this is not a new question, but the expectation was modified. Probably several of you receive a downscore in this question related with storage. That should storage area should be completely enclosed. Well, when we talk about products, yes, usually it's in compliance. The problem is packaging material. Very common in the industry that you keep the packaging material in an open yard, of course, over pallets of the ground, wrapped in plastic, under a pest control program. Yeah. But even that, in version 2.1, that was a deviation. Yeah, usually a major for food contact packaging and a minor for non-food contact pa pa packaging. Well, the change here is, if you keep non-food contact packaging in an open jar off the ground and wrapped in plastic, for example, protected from the environment and under your pest control program, you will be in compliance. But in the case of food contact packaging, we go back to version 2.1 in terms of, you know, requirements. If you're storing this in an open area, yeah, food contact packaging, uh, even if over uh, pallets and wrapped, uh, will be a major. So at least they relax a little bit the expectation for this accessory requirement in version 2.1 for non-food contact packaging. And this one, can, as I told, I told you about this one. This requirement of fresh potable drinking water for worker was in the farm, in greenhouse, uh, in harvest crews, but not in the facility checklist. Well, now we have that. So there should be evidence that you're providing potable water, you know, to your workers. Now, is testing required? No. Verbal to verification of the water source is enough. Now, if you make reference that you're using municipal water, bottled water, uh, or even well water, yeah, we're going to check the test in other question problem. I mean the, the, the water test. But uh, if you say for a kind of crazy scenario, you're pulling water from a river, uh, in that case, the outdoor could have the right, has, have the right to request water testing to assure that the water that you're providing for your workers, uh, it's... Um, it uh, uh, meets the EPA drinking water standards in the case of the United States. And I have a question here by Sierra Anderson. Would beans be considered food contact? What if they're stored outside? Oh, yes. It's a storage. If the facility uses beans and they keep them, you know, in an external area, as a first step approach, 
Yes, I will say that it's a deviation, it's food contact, but it depends. Not everything is written in the guidelines. Guidelines are guidelines. They give, they gave us, you know, an idea of how to comply with this. But an auditor and you must use common sense too. What about if you show me that, and I've seen this in the industry, each time that the beans, you know, are shipped to the, uh, to the farms, to the fields, they pass through a, uh, washing equipment where they are washing and disinfecting them. Think about the purpose of this. The purpose of this requirement of the storage is to keep them clean without contamination, without evidence of pest activity. So what about if you have them in an open area, but then after, before you send them to the fields, you wash and disinfect them? In that case, how do you apply common sense? Because you're meeting the purpose of that requirement is to keep these materials safe in terms of contamination. Yeah. No, that is not written in the guidelines, so auditor discretion will apply and not all the auditors have the same yeah. common sense. Yeah, so it will depend. By the book, oh yeah, it is. Sierra, did I answer your question? Make sense? Okay, let's move to the next one. Section worker practices. For the people who was used to, to use the old Primus standard audit program, this question is will be familiar. This is a question who came back from the past. Are workers issued with non-reproducible? Oh, Sierra? Okay, Sierra, you know what? If you want to talk more about this, what about if we leave this for the end of the session? In fact, I can give you, I can, you know, open the microphone to your side, okay? But don't forget something. 99% of the weight of that question is based in product and packaging material. Yeah? So usually auditors are not including bins. We can review. Do you know what's the, the, the deal? We need to see the updated interpretation guideline to see if there's any specific reference for this. And as I told you when we, are, we, we opened the session, the interpretation guidelines are still in the oven. Yeah? Probably they're almost ready. Yeah? But they're still not ready, you know, for us. Anyway, going back to this question. Uh, workers, in any company with 20 or more workers, this question is mandatory. You need to provide to your workers with ID cards, including the picture, the name, or the number of the worker, yeah? And his or her position in the company. That's all. How we assess this during the facility tour, auditors are going to choose two or three workers. I'm going to ask them to show the ID. Now, if the company use less than 20 workers, that means 19 or less, if you're not providing those uh, ID uh, cards, this question becomes non-applicable. But if you're providing them, uh, it's still applicable, yeah? Section site, this following question will bring the artist in you. There's two questions, the, the following two questions are related with maps, with diagrams, with uh, draws, yeah? drawings. Uh, is there a site plan showing the facility location, the adjacent site, roads, water sources, the well, from where comes, you know, the municipal water, if you're using municipal water, the storm water, wastewater system, and other relevant features. So this is a draw, you know, where you need to identify everything that's happening around your production buildings. Identify each one of these items. Uh, a good starting point could be to use as a reference the pest control schematic given by the pest control operator. Usually when you're using an external operator, those guys are really good doing those maps. So you can start with that base, you know, to do this map of the external areas of the facility. But in the next question, sure you know where I'm going, or the standard is going. Now, again, it's another map, another plan, but now the inside of the facility where you need to show the breakdown of rooms, the purpose of them, equipment, and something very important, the traffic flow patterns. And this is something very important that could be very useful. Yeah? Well, during this inspection, we just want to see, you know, the this internal draw or map of the facility, identifying the different rooms, uh, the equipment, the layout of the equipment, and the traffic patterns. This could be very helpful if you have heats during your swabbing program, for example, of Listeria or Salmonella. 
Yeah? If you put those hits, those positives in the map, maybe it could help you to discover why are you having problems of, let's say, hysteria. For example, analyzing, checking, you know, the Patrick, the, 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 the traffic pattern of the forklifts. Maybe you're using forklift in and out, you know, the, the same forklifts who are in the external areas of the production areas go inside. Then you can analyze through where they're, you know, running. Maybe the forklift is the vehicle of cross-contamination spreading listeria for you through your facility. Yeah. Anyway, going back to the requirement, the requirement is to have this map. Yeah. The guideline refers that the flow is ideally in one direction, as is very common in the produce industry, and follows a logical sequence from raw material up to finished product storage. Now, when you see the word ideal in any part of the standard, think about that word as a recommendation, not a reason for a downscore. Yeah? So if you don't comply with any ideal uh, condition or uh, thing written in the standard, that's not mean that you're going to be downscored because of that. Yeah. Don't forget this map is not just to show the rooms, it's the flow pattern for workers, equipment, and something else. The layout of your equipment, in other, in other words, the steps in your process, but from an equipment perspective, like the flow diagram that you do for your hazard program, but now, now don't think in process, think in the equipment itself. Yeah. Here we have an example. Yeah, uh, we have, you know, the map or the plan of the inside of the facility, the different rooms. And then we add the traffic patterns for this. Let's say that blue means workers and green means, you know, vehicles like the forklets. Yeah, this is what is expected to see for this uh, requirement. And that's all these are all the new stuff you know in this section yeah the facility tour module 5 gmp section now we're going to check you know the changes of the new stuff uh, in the documental part of module 5 that means from question 51101 up to the end of the checklist in module 5 okay the first new question 51305, this is in the section operational practices. Other record of visual monitoring and or testing and changing of recirculated and batch water system for buildup of organic material, turbidity. This is brand new in the standard. In the past, you know, when there's a dam tank, for example, an hydro cooler, we were mostly focused, you know, in the strength of the antimicrobials, you know, to have a system to prevent cross-contamination by issues with water. Uh, now they add just something related with physical contamination, turbidity. Yeah? So the first thing is, if you don't have such type of steps in your process, forget this requirement. Let's say that you're a dry operation, you don't have any type of wash steps or, or chilling steps, forget this. But if you have them, there should be records of visual monitoring and test and, and or testing and water changing when it's, when it's reused or recirculated water. Now, the frequency for change to, for the water changing, according to the guidelines, is at least daily. In some areas, it could be a concern. I've seen operations, for example, carrot operation, where they keep the water for up to 30 days. Yeah? Now, the guidelines refers at least a daily change, unless, unless you're able to justify through a valid, you know, uh, study, own or external, you know, that your... Um, there's no significant food safety concerns in terms of physical contamination by suspended solids in the water. Yeah. I've seen many ways to deal with this. I remember a company uh, washing the apples uh, and they were washing the water, they're changing the water once a week. So what they did, uh, they pulled samples in the middle of the seven days, let's water samples on day number three, and on day number seven, before you know, change the water to demonstrate that the water after seven days has no significant food safety concern. Now, what type of food safety concern? Well, first we start with biology, biological concern. So you should be checking, for example, for total coliforms, the classic uh, quality indicator for water. Yeah. Uh, but also could be other type of concern. What about pesticide residues? 
yeah, could, there could be the chances of accumulating, you know, a buildup of uh, pesticide residues because you're passing too much product who was freshly applied, you know, very close to harvest with different chemicals. One second, I have a question. Okay, uh, the first question. Uh, if we empty our hydro cooler, do we need to document the day we emptied and refill? Yes, water changing records are required, Sierra. Second question by Sierra Anderson too. If we have an automated system that looks data on turbidity, does this count as record? Yes, of course. Yeah, probably your equipment has a nanophilometer. Ah, nanophilometer. Yeah, if that is the case, yes, that is that is going to work. Such type of equipment, you know, measures turbidity in, in water. In other words, you know, suspended solids. Yes, that works. But there should be record of that. Uh, probably your software or the system as a system, you know, a, a method to display graphics or records about that. Let's talk a little bit about turbidity. What is the definition of turbidity? Turbidity is caused by particles suspended or dissolved in water that scatter light, making the water appear cloudy or murky. Particulate matter can include sediments, especially clay and silt, fine organic and inorganic matter, soluble color organic compounds, algae, and other microscopic organisms. The common measurement unit for turbidity is the Formacin Turbidity Unit, FTU. Uh, there's an ISO, you know, who makes reference to this, ISO 7027, that provides a method in water quality for the determination of the turbidity, which is the purpose of this requirement to determine accurately when water should be changed. The threshold of turbidity, of turbidity, so when the water must be changed based on turbidity, must be determined by the operation and related to the risk of that process. Now, this is the theoretical, you know, definition. Please don't think that you need to start measuring, you know, the formless in turbidity units. This is just to have an idea from where this comes and it's just, there's a scientific method to deal with this. But this is theory, not the reality. This is not in the guideline. These are ideas, you know, that I developed for this. Practical application in the food industry. We're thinking about turbidity. For example, for operation washing, chilling entire products, not processing them, the risk is lower, but of course, you're not interfering the pulp yeah, of the product. The turbidity, could, the turbidity could be measured visually using a color pattern design in-house or using a basic method like a secchi disc. Can you see that thing in the, in the picture on the top? That's a secchi disc. If you want to make one, or if you buy one, you know what's the cost of that? $7 in Amazon. <laughs> so it's very cheap technology. The idea is to, see, to submerge, you know, this secchi disc, and when you are not able to see the color, means you know that that's a threshold of turbidity. And based on the length of the cord, you define, you know, the cord, the wire that they're using for this equipment, you define, you know, which is a threshold for water changing. Other idea could be using color patterns. You have a, you know, a document with color patterns, so the operator of the water step, you know, knows when the water looks of that color, they need to change the water, even if it's before the schedule water changing. Yeah. Now, when we're talking about processors, where the product is washed after slicing, for example, uh, maybe you should be using using something more accurate, like a turbidity meter, a, a nifilometer. I've seen these ones. They cost around. I've seen very good ones who cost around between five hundred to one thousand uh, dollars. They include not just turbidity. They have free chlorine or P, etc. So maybe you can kill several shots, so several several birds with one shot with an equipment like that. Now, this is not part of the guidelines. I'm just giving you ideas based on my thoughts, yeah? Let me see if there's any other question about turbidity. Okay, no, so let's move to the next one. The next questions are new questions in the section maintenance and sanitation files. First, this is a nice new requirement. Are there records showing verification of cleaning and sanitizing chemical concentrations? So, when you're performing your cleaning activities, uh, let's say you're using as a last step disinfection of food contact surfaces with chlorine, 
Uh, well, now there's a new record that you're going to need to implement. Record showing the strength of that sanitation, that disinfection solution before you use it. See if your SOP set, for example, that the strength of chlorine should be 200 parts per million, someone should check before start using that sanitation solution that the 200 parts per million are there. Yeah. Now, you define, you know, through your SOPs, the strength that is required could be a specific number, a threshold, your call. Now, it should make sense. If you tell me I'm, it's one parts per million of free chlorine in disinfection water, oh, I'm sorry, that's, you know, the strength that comes from the municipal water. It's not going to work. Yeah. Um, now, this should be recorded for each batch of cleaning, oh sorry, sanitation solution that you're using. For example, if your cleaning crews are preparing, you know, disinfection solution in 10 different containers, each one of them should be, you know, monitored and then uh, recorded, you know, that they're in compliance with the uh, strength, you know, state in your uh, cleaning procedures. Well, if you don't have that currently in your cleaning SOPs, you're going to need to add that there or in an annex. Following question, another brand new question. Uh, other records showing filters in air conditioning, ventilation and air filtration units are regular, regularly cleaned or replaced. First, this question is only applicable if you have such type of system yeah, in, uh, in your operation. If, if don't, if, if you don't, of course it's an A. Now, if there's, you know, for example, refrigeration systems, you know, in the production areas, very common in processors, or you have, you know, air condition, air conditioning systems, you know, to production, or in storage areas, you know, the filters of those equipment must be clean or replaced according, according the manufacturer recommendation. Now, if you don't have them, uh, a good advice is talk with your maintenance people. Usually they know that. Now you need to document this, you know, keeping records when they change, you know, these filters. Now, talking seriously, really this is not a new requirement. This should be part of your regular um, preventive maintenance program. Don't forget that that program should consider these type of things, you know, the replacement, in this case, of the filters in ventilation or air conditioning, air conditioning equipments. I uh, have another question by Sierra. Does this go for auto diluters? Ah, Sierra, could you please clarify to your question? I'm not sure where about which question are we talking. Ah, you're talking about premix solutions. If we're if you're using, if any of you is using pre-mix solutions, in other words, you open the containers and you, you can start using to disinfect surfaces, of course, you're excluded of these requirements. In fact, you know, here it says, where cleaning and sanitation mix chemicals are mixed on site, yeah? Yes, in that case, if you're using ready-to-use, you know, sanitizers, no, forget this requirement. It's when there's dilutions, mixing, happening in the facility. The auto-mixers, ah, uh, no, 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 that's mixing on site, in that case, if this auto mixer system is, does not have a software as a, a system, you know, to come to prove the strength of this, the antimicrobial that you're using in that solution, I'm sorry, you need to keep records. Yeah. So using auto mixers to dispense is not enough. Records are required because the mixing is happening on site, not by people, but automatic system. But even that required to have those records. Yeah. Okay, uh, I think I answered that, yeah? But don't forget the keys mixing on site by people or by automatic system. If that is the case, records are required. NA, not applicable if you're using, you know, ready to use, you know, chemicals. Okay, here I have a, a comment by Hector. We do use an auto mixer, but still test concentration. We have found nozzles that are defective from manufacturers by testing. Excellent, Hector. Here we have a class, you know, a very good real example why even if you're using an auto mixer is required, you know, for you to monitor and record the strength of those antimicrobials in use. Uh, next question. Records of food safety non-conformance and associated corrective action. The first thing that I'm going to clarify, this question or this record is required when there are systematic violations by a specific workers 
against, you know, different or the same, you know, food safety policy, or when a group of people is failing against the same policy. For example, you know that that is very common for your people to miss the use of hair restraints and you require them, you know, to use them in production areas. So in that case, the systematic is not by one worker. It's because the team, your, your, your uh, facility workers are failing. So when that happens, it's required, you know, to document which was the issue noted, yeah, and the corrective action implemented that usually is a retraining. I say, I said, usually, why? Because maybe it's not a problem of, ret of training. Maybe it's a problem of supervision, yeah? Uh, now, talking about this record, if you, your company, consider this record as confidential, you need to explain that to your auditor, and the auditor is going to assess this question from a verbal perspective, but at least be able to show them the form that you're using for this purpose. Section testing. Here's the, the most important surgery, changes in the standard. Now we have several questions about testing, and believe me, for me, they make a lot of sense. Let's go over the first one. Forget the thing about, you know, equipment swabbing, environmental swabbing, no. Now it's a very open question. There should be a written, risk-based, scientifically valid microbiological testing program. Keyword, scientific valid. For example, for this, you need to understand a little bit about microbiology. Uh, let me tell you an example, Listeria. Listeria is able to grow in temperatures of over 32 Fahrenheit degrees, not E. coli, not uh, Salmonella. So usually in a cold room, thinking in the pathogen multiplication concern makes more sense to check for Listeria than for Salmonella. Why? Because in, te in temperatures below uh, sorry, I think in the international medical system, below five Celsius degrees, Salmonella and E. coli are not able to multiply. But please note my words, multiply. I'm not saying that the temperature is going to kill them. But Listeria, yes. In fact, Listeria can grow in your refrigerator at your home. Why? Because, you know, that's refri refrigeration temperature. So maybe it makes more sense if you're looking for specific pathogen testing, you know, environmental testing in cold rooms, makes more sense to test for Listeria. I'm not saying that it's not a good idea to test for E. coli and for Salmonella, but the auditor is going to challenge you. I've seen people doing horrible things, you know, for example, uh, swabbing for botulism in a pre-produced industry. That's for cannery, yeah? So you need to understand a little bit about microbiology to design a good microbiological testing program that is a scientific valid. Uh, we're in the 21st century. All this information is in the internet. I'm, I'm not saying that you need to go to a specific microbiological training. Do your own research. Think in the bad guys of the movie in the produce industry. Historically, the three biggest concerns in terms of pathogens are E. coli, mostly the train 157 and the 104, the one who did a mess in Europe three years or three or four years ago, uh, Salmonella and Listeria. Historically, in the produce, in the fruit and vegetable industry, those are the three bad guys of the movie. So think about them. So it makes sense to focus your resources in pathogens of concern based on historical events. So you can justify why you choose those, for example, to swap environmental for those pathogens based on that historical data. You're not going to reinvent the wheel. You can just make reference, okay, look, the outbreaks, let's say in the United States, in the produce industry, in the last 10 years, probably the 90%, you know, in microbiological concerns are related with these three guys, Listeria, Salmonella, and E. coli. Yeah? Let's continue with this. This may include pathogen testing and details program design, sonal approach. I'm going to talk about that in the next slide. Uh, so a good starting point is, point is to use the FDA sonal approach. Also, it's not the same food contact than non-food contact. Different risk, yeah? Spend sprout irrigation water. For example, if you're growing alfalfa sprout, sprouts, in that case, it makes a lot of sense to test the water that you use to grow those sprouts, yeah? Test and hold. <coughs> it's not common in the produce industry, but some 
you know, processor, for example, send them a, a, a sample of the final product to the laboratory and they don't ship until, you know, they have the result to be sure that there's no, you know, microbiological concerns, etc. At the very end, you design your program, but the auditor is going to challenge you. Yeah? Why did you choose this? So a program written in stone, downloaded from the internet, I'm not sure if it's going to work for you guys because the author is going to relate the program with the reality of your operation. Let's say, for example, where to swap, yeah? Oh no, first, the first question, do you need to swap? There's nothing that says that you must swap, yeah? At least in the guidelines. There's a draft of a applicability chart that probably is going to be released soon by Prime GFS. If we're talking about version 3.0, forget this comment. You do everything and the auditor challenge you. But in 3.1, we have a minimum, you know, per type of operation and type of process. But think about something. If you think in the most significant events in terms of food safety in the world industry, uh, in the last 10 years, not just in the United States, usually they are caused or by people or by water. So if you have a high humidity cause you know storage or you are uh you, you have a wash step in your facility, yes, that increases the risk. So your swabbing program should focus on those areas. Water is required by the microbes, by the pathogens, by listeria, by salmonella to, and E. coli to multiply. If there's no water for them, it becomes very complicated to, for them to multiply. I have a question here. 560 from Lisa Winter. 516.01, this question, 516.02, if your risk assessment determines an environmental program is not necessary, for example, a dry packing facility, is an EMP required by the standard? I'm not sure what you're referring with an EMP, but I'm going to show you in the next slides that, yes, for 3.1, there's an applicability chart. That makes a lot of sense what you just told me, yeah? Dry operation. Dry operations usually are very low risk operation. Water is the, the classic vehicle of cross contamination in the food industry, in all type of food industry. And people, yeah. Well, people, yeah. We have people in the facility, yeah. Uh, but water, oh yeah. So if you're using water, if you're not using water, that reduces a lot of the a lot of the risk. But Lisa, give me a couple of slides and I'm going to show you which are the minimum sets for type of operation and type of process according revision one. That chart is not in, in revision zero, zero, yeah, but it's in revision one. I have another comment or question here. Derek Davis ah, from Washington. Hi, Derek. In the apple industry, we change recirculated water every day. Do we still need to measure turbidity? Yes, sir. Even that you're required to measure turbidity, yeah? Okay, so let's continue with this. The first thing is, why are you doing microbiological, te micro microbiological testing? Why? I, I know that what is in the mind of several of you, because it's a requirement of the standard. Wrong answer. No. This is for you. Yeah. Now, it's a consequence of your compliance against the standard. One of the most important purposes of microbiological testing, you know, in specific equipment and environmental, is to assess the efficiency of your cleaning practices. And secondary, to detect any problem of pathogen resistance. And a personal comment, yeah, have you noted that every year we're having more and more, you know, problems, outbreak caused by microbiological, you know, uh, pathogens like uh, listeria? Why? Well, maybe we're monitoring more than in the past. Yeah, that's correct. But also, with our efficient cleaning processes, we're selecting at the same time the most resistant strains of these bad guys. Yeah? Uh, let's say that you have 1,000 listerias, you know, in a surface, and you apply chlorine, and you kill the 99% of them. Maybe 1% of them has developed, for example, a better, uh, thicker biofilm, so that they resist you know, in a better way, the action of those chemicals. The problem is the next generation of those survivals, probably they're going to inherit, you know, that genetic condition. There's a couple of things in the internet about this. Uh, and I don't have any specific 
study to refer about this, but it's just common sense. It's like the antibiotics. In the 70s, penicillin oh, was working fine for almost everything. Now there's no even penicillin in the market because, you know, we select the most, res you know, resistant strains of bacteria. You know, so we select through the years and the bad use of the antibiotics, not following our doctor recommendations, we select the most resistant strains. Yeah? Now, something important also in this, you know, question. You need to include, once you decide where to test, what to test, yeah? The document, the, the written program should make reference for the timing. The timing should be after, immediately after, you know, the cleaning activities. The frequency of testing, yeah? For surfaces, for water, for product, for ingredients. The timing and frequency, I, I said, I said that, uh, and the testing methodology, the lab that performed the tests, I'm, I'm not so comfortable with the thing about the lab, yeah? Uh, seems that the standard is looking for the name of the lab. Maybe an alternative could be, you know, the technical competence of the lab. Maybe you can make reference to a lab, you know, who is accredited or certified under ISO 17025, you know, the good laboratory practices. And something very important that is usually missed in this type of document, the acceptable result, the threshold levels for each organism or generic indicator. Let's say that in your program you decide to do, you know, to swap food contact surfaces for total plate count. And also in the environmental program you have, you know, swabbing for listeria in the cold room because you have some condensation problems there. Uh, well, you need to set the thresholds. Yeah, in the United States, for listeria threshold by law, you know, we know negative. But think about this: it, you know, who defined those thresholds for listeria in the United States is the government. In other countries, for certain food, it's possible, you know, and it's not considered adulterated products. Certain levels of listeria. So, in this case, the best approach is to follow, you know, the in the case of United States, you know, facilities to follow United States regulation. No presence of E. coli, no presence of salmonella and listeria or under the detection limit. Yeah. So you should write that in your document. Now, if you're using generic indicator for total plate count, well, there's no regulations by the government in the case of the United States or in my country in Chile related with the acceptable threshold level. So in other words, you need to set them. Okay, I'm going to go over out of the standard now, and I'm going I'm going to show you a couple of slides related with with some ideas in how to deal with this. Okay, in the scope of sanitation, the purpose of the testing program is to assess the efficiency of your cleaning programs and practices. In other words, if your SOPs and your people is doing a good job, you know, meeting the purpose, accomplishing the purpose to clean and disinfect disinfect, at least for food contact surfaces. The standard does not define what, when, and where to test. This is responsibility of the operation food safety team based on risk, but be prepared to justify your program. But I'm going to overwrite something here. The when, the frequency, there's a proposal that is still a draft uh, about the minimum testing frequency, yeah? And the applicability of equipment and environmental testing. But this is still a trap, so I cannot assure you that thing that I'm gonna show you after these slides will be in the standard, probably yes. Yeah. Okay, the first question is where to test, swap? This is not just to close the eyes and choose, okay, here, there, and there, or throwing, you know, a dice to decide where to swap. The program should consider based on risk of the product itself and the process, the equipment and areas to be swapped, like, food contact surfaces. Yeah, it's more important to know what happens in your on, onto your food contact surfaces, maybe that are done on the floors. High humidity and wet areas like drains, areas with condensation issues. Yeah, The FDA zonal approach could be used as a reference. Now, don't forget, high humidity, wet areas, again, I'm talking about water. Uh, microorganisms, you know, the most important ones, at least, you know, in the produce industry, needs water for multiply. If they don't multiply, that reduces the risk. Yeah? So, for this, you should walk through your facility, observe the process, and based on that, decide where are you going to swap. Sonal approach. The FDI defines four zones, you know, uh, for this purpose. The first, zone one, food contact surfaces. Of course, this is categorized by risk. Food zone one, 
Red flag, the most important one. Food contact surfaces like utensils, like knives, clippers, table surfaces, slicers, pipe interiors. If you have recirculated water, that's a food contact surface. Or if you're in the juice industry, of course, you know those pipelines are food contact surfaces. Tank interiors, fillers, uh, bowls, conveyors, hoppers, etc. Zone two. Those are non-food contact surfaces, but in close proximity to food and food contact surfaces. For, exa for example, the equipment, housing, or framework. Some walls and floors who are immediately very close next to food contact surfaces. So three, more remote non-food contact surfaces that are in or near the processing areas and could lead to contamination of, of some zones one and two. For example, forklift, hand tracks, Carts that move within the plant and some walls, floors, or drains not in the immediate vicinity of the food contact surfaces. And so four, remote areas outside of the processing area from which environmental pathogens can be introduced into the processing environment, like locker rooms, break rooms, storages, etc. Yeah. So having this in mind, we could use this reference because the government classified this, the FDI, based on risk, as a first approach to decide where to swap. For me, zone one, if you have humidity in any zone one, yes, yeah? the same in zone two. Zone three, depending the risk of the process, the product is not the same, a romaine lettuce processor than a potato packing house, yeah? What to test? The standard does not define or does not give any guidelines or requirement in regards to how, what to test. So the, the question is, do I need to use generic indicators or a specific pathogen testing or a mix of between both? So to keep in mind, a generic indicator, well, the most used when assessing cleaning efficiency. Some examples are, Total plate count, one of the favorites in the produce industry. The total plate count is an enumeration of aerobic mesophilic organisms that grow in aerobic condition in the presence of oxygen. Yeah? Under moderate temperatures in between 20 to 45 Celsius degrees, more or less the temperature in any classic, you know, produce facility. This includes all aerobic bacteria, including Listeria, Salmonella, E. coli, and a lot of other bacteria, yeast, molds, and fungi. This count includes all pathogens and non-pathogens aerobic present, potentially present uh, in the surface or in the tool. Yeah? Uh, as I see, this is my favorite, you know, generic indicator because covers a lot. Yeah? Total coliform, another generic indicator, includes bacteria that are found in the soil, in water that has been influenced by surface water and in human and animal waste or something Still, it is still, you know, generic, but a little more, be more precise regarding fecal contamination. Fecal coliforms. Now, if you are doing total plate count, at the same time, you're assessing total coliforms and fecal coliform and E. coli and Listeria and everything. Now, you're not going to have a specific account per type of organism, but you have the big picture. Yeah. Now, which is a good or a bad result for this type of indicators? Okay. For the three indicators, there are no limits set in stone by the government or by industry guidelines. Therefore, you will need to set them based on scientific reference or your own historical data. I'm going to give you an example. I found this in the internet, a study, a proposal by Mr. Daniel Fung, PhD from Arizona University. In food contact surfaces, total plate count, an account between zero to 10 colonies per square centimeter is a low count, no particular concerns between 10 to 100, intermediate counts, slight concern, and over 100 high counts needs corrective actions, yeah? Now, this is one of many, you know, starting points that you can find in the internet. The thing is, at the very end, the best call is to use your historical data. Let's say that you're swabbing on a specific, you know, packing table for three, four months. And usually your, uh, your accounts for total plate count runs in between 10 to 50 colonies. Maybe you could set, you know, more or less an average or the most, you know, uh, significant finding, you know, in terms of, account, of counts as your threshold. 
So if in the future, for example, in the same surface, you have a 100, that is not a usual result. So something happened. Maybe your crew failed, you know, executing, you know, your cleaning SOPs. So in that case, you know, that is exceeding that metrics that you set based on your historical information. Now, the best call is a combination of both. Scientific evidence, you know, from validation study from the internet, plus your historical data, yeah? Now, specific pathogens. If you decide, decide to take that path, uh, like E. coli, E. coli 157, Salmonella, Listeria. Now, important, important, do some research about your product and processes, historical events, to focus your resources. For example, if we're talking about a company running romaine lettuce, uh, if I have to choose between pathogens, I'm going to focus on E. coli 157. Why? Because it happens. We have two outbreaks, you know, in the last times related with romaine lettuce and E. coli 157. Yeah? If we're talking about cantaloupe melons, uh, the last outbreak kills over 30 people, so by listeria. So I'm going to use, I'm going to be testing for listeria, for sure. I don't need to reinvent the wheel. It happens. Yeah? It's a historical event. I don't want to commit the same mistake. So do some research about pathogen of concerns, growth conditions, and then decide. So historical events plus scientific knowledge will give you the best tools to decide if you're going to take the path of specific pathogens uh, testing, which one to test. Now, if you say, which is the perfect scenario? Test all of them. <laughs> yeah. Um, by the way, for food contact surfaces, all these pathogens should be non-detectable. If there's any heat of these pathogens in food contact surfaces without corrective actions, including potentially affected product, the auditor will revert to the classic automatic failure question in the, in, because evidence of pathogen contamination in food contact surface. When to test? Well, version three, revision one, considers an applicability table for different type of operation. Based on this, a frequency is proposed. Yeah, but this table is intended for guidance only. Situations will vary depending on process, product, and intended use. So if you decide not to follow this, you know, uh, following table, you know, written like in stone, if you decide to modify this, yes, you can do it, but you need to have very good technical ammunition to justify why. Yeah. And this is the, the table. First, for storage and distribution type of operation. Uh, no storage or handling of ice product and no high humidity. The minimum sampling and testing frequency will be quarterly, yeah? And the minimum sampling zones on three and four, according to the FDA definition. Now, the same type of operation with ice, for example, top ice broccoli, or problems of condensation, high humidity in the cold rooms, the frequency changed to monthly, yeah, for zone three and four. Yeah, because we don't have zones one and two because it's a storage and distribution center. Dry goods at ambient temperatures, not required. In this case, could go to NA. Now, temperature control goods in between 30, you know, over 32 Fahrenheit degrees or in Celsius, over zero, zero Celsius degrees, monthly testing for zones three and four. Let's see the one that you really are waiting for. For cooling and cold storage and packing house. Cooling and cold storage, it doesn't matter the products or the commodities, monthly swabbing for zones one, two, three, and four. Now, it's not just to choose one, one zone one, one zone two, one zone three, one zone four. No, no, no. It depends on the reality of your operation. So if you have too many zone ones, more than one zone one with high humidity, the other one is going to downscore if you're not swabbing in all of that. Packing house, potentially ready to eat and or, or with high humidity storage. What means ready to eat in, in the prime with GFS, you know, uh, wording means whatever could be eaten without cooking. Yeah? So we're talking about almost everything. There's no products that they're always cook before consumption. You know what you're thinking? What about uh, 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 potatoes? Well, I can show you in the internet, many restaurants, you know, for vegan people, you know, usually for vegan people who offers raw salads, including raw potatoes. Yeah. Uh, asparagus, the same. Yeah. The artichokes. I've seen, you know, restaurants, you know, offering and receipts in the internet 
to eat, you know, make salads with raw artichokes. So really, almost everything is ready to eat, unless the product of the, the consumer packaging includes a label that refers the product must be cooked before consumption. That's the key. Okay, in the case of the packing house, monthly swabbing zones one, two, three, and four. And no ready to eat, for example, potatoes, hard squash, beans, pulses, and grains. If you can prove, you know, that the consumer is informed that they should be cooked before consumption, not required. And processors. Oh, here the frequency is very tough. Cut fruit weekly, again, zones one to four. Cut vegetables weekly. Slice mushrooms weekly. Sprouts weekly. For sprouts, I think it's kind of weak. Sprouts, have you seen that there's at least one, you know, big recall by alfalfa sprouts once a month in the US? Mixed plant and animal perishable products weekly. Juice, but with pH below 4.5, acidified products quarterly, but with pH over 4.5 monthly. Yeah. For this reference, they pull, you know, the acidified pro, uh, food, you know, regulations by the FDA. Any question about this, folks? Do you like the frequencies? Oh. Personal comments. In my case, I think most of the frequencies is where are you swabbing, but at the end, I have to out it against, you know, these metrics. And if you're not going to follow follow them, you need to have very good technical ammunition. But start thinking in what and where. Then, then after, you know, start thinking, you know, in when, I mean the frequency. Okay, the following question is just the evidence of compliance with your program. If you say that you're going to swap in A, B, and C, areas of the facility in certain in a weekly frequency okay may i see those tests so testing should be recorded including the organism tested for the testing methodology lab that performed the test details of the sampling sites when the test occur and the result well all that information is by default in any you know laboratory report if any issues are detected corrective action should be recorded recorded Testing should meet written program requirements, including sonar approach, food contact, and again, the same. So in other words, the second question is the evidence of the implementation of the program that you wrote for the first question, for 516.01. But don't forget, start thinking in the purpose of your microbiological testing program, not in the audit itself. Why are you doing this? The first call is to assess the efficiency of your cleaning practices, and the second one is to detect problems with pathogen resistance. 516.03, other regular microbiological tests on water used in the facility. This is kind of a redundancy because water should be included in your testing program. But even that, Primary GFS kept this question. Yeah. So the water used in the facility should be tested. This question is always applicable, even if you're dry operation. Why if you're a dry operation? Uh, do you use water to wash the hands of your workers? There you have water. Do you use water for the cleaning activities? So I've never seen a 100% dry operation. Yeah? So uh, there should be microbiological tests on water using the facility on a routine basis to assure it meets the microbiolo microbiolo microbiological requirements of potable water. Again, we call here the EPA drinking water standard. If you are pulling sample for total coliforms, you're okay. But just an advice, even if you cover the requirements of this question with total coliform, I highly recommend also to test for E. coli. Why? If you have a presence of total coliform, it's a, let's say, a yellow flag. It's a concern. But if you have E. coli, it's a red flag. E. coli is, you know, feces, yeah, poop, caca <laughs> in, <laughs> in your water. Uh, the thing is, a couple of times, I remember to see water tests that they show a low presence of total coliform. But in some cases, they were able to prove it. Hey, Enrique, yes, I have some total coliform, but at the same time, my lab test showed that there's no presence of E. coli. So in that case, the corrective action is only against the water. But if you have E. coli in the water, you need to, you, you need to start thinking, what about my product? You know, my product could be contaminated, for example, by cross-contamination because I'm using that water for hand washing. I'm using that water for, for, for that water for cleaning activities, or even more, I'm using that water for product wash. So, 
just in case to cover all the bases and avoid any problems during inspection. And also to be sure in case that you have a heat with total coryform that you don't have E. coli, that is the really mean, you know, bacteria in this group of, you know, bacteria, the coliforms, test for both. It's not so much money, yeah? Now, a single out of specification microbiological test result without proper corrective actions, if it's total coli from the water only, but if you, you're not able to prove that there was no E. coli in that potential contaminated water, your corrective action should also consider products. So we're talking about products, product testing, even thinking about product recall. Yeah? If not, the audit will fail. So again, please folks, total coliforms and E. coli. Yeah, just to cover that concern. Uh, 51606, add the record of any other test. In the past, when I was auditing, you know, primary GFS version 2.1, sometimes in the binder of lab testing, there were some product testing results, but I was not able to use them during the inspection because I don't have a question to fit them. Yeah, now I have this question. So if there's any other type of testing, product testing, uh, by a customer requirement, by regulatory requirement, or because you want to do it, yes, we are going to review those tests and we're going to check, you know, that those tests, you know, include the classic information of any lab result date, where, where type of product, you know, the date, the lab that did the, uh, the analysis, uh, the results, etc. yeah? But this is not only with scope to microbiological testing. What about other type of testing? What about MRLs? That's the thing. If you're shipping overseas, for example, to Europe, we know that the MRLs of Europe are absolutely more restrictive than, than the one in the US. I've seen cases up to 100 times more restrictive. Two zeros, yeah? So, yes, in that case, you should be pulling sample for ML, MRL test. And forget a little bit the audit. It's suicide to ship to a country where the MRLs are more strict than the countries of production without being sure that you're in compliance with them. Because if not, you can have economic, you know, dramatic economic problems. Yeah. Okay, I have here a comment by Ron. I receive a minor because I did not have test for total coliform when I had result for E. coli. Yes, because uh, and that's it, a brief parenthesis. Worldwide, you know, in the civilized world, based on, you know, the World Health Organization, the GFSI, and the standards we use the GFSI as a reference, like primary GFS, like BRC, like global cap, there's two type of micro, uh, microbiological quality indicator for water. Pre-harvest is E. coli. Post-harvest is total coliform. This is a standard in the worldwide industry, yeah? So, you, you test your facility water only for E. coli, so you're not covering all the bases. You should be testing for total coliform. And may I tell you something wrong? According to the interpretation guidelines, at least in revision three, that's a major, not a minor, yeah? So <laughs> I don't suggest you to go over an appeal. Maybe <laughs> the appeal committee is going to change the minor to a major, yeah? But it's clear, you need to be able to prove that the post harvest water, if this is across the whole food industry, meets, you know, the drinking water standards. And across all the world, the drinking water standards are in almost all the civilized countries the same, total coliform. There's a few countries who make reference to fecal coliform. But if you see the guidelines, even if the country of production make reference to fecal coliforms, at least you know the minimum, the limit, is the one set by the EPA when we are auditing Primo GFS. So in other words, total coliforms. Uh, 51607, that was a missing piece, you know, in version 2.1. There should be procedures in how to deal with unsuitable uh, or unacceptable test results for any type, for swaps, products, water. So you need to have a plan written in how you're going to deal if you have any type of unsuitable result. And the plan, of course, should make reference of what to do with the with the water itself or the product itself or the surface, and also consider potentially affected product, yeah? Um, the SOP should contain, contain or consider the following. Uh, detailed actions to take when an acceptable results are received based on the risk that contamination could result in contaminated food and consumer illness and describing the step-by-step, -step, you know, step uh, steps to take. 
assign the responsibility for taking those steps. So the SOP should identify who or who are the people responsible to deal with those corrective action suggestions instead of names, use positions, yeah? Because it's not very common that people, you know, move from one company to the other one. So you don't need to rewrite everything. Don't forget that we have in the FSMS, the organizational chart where you identify the people covering a specific position. So we can relate that to identify who is the person just using as a reference the position you know, uh, in this SOP. Um, this may include also the root cause analysis. I prefer to use the word determination of the cause, why that happened, intensified sampling and testing review of the SOP, sanitation and maintenance program, etc. And lastly, if there's any evidence of an unsuitable test result, there should be a record showing that the steps defined in your SOP were implemented. So we need to see the records of your corrective action. That's all. Yeah? If there's no unsuitable results during the period being analyzed during the inspection, well, an A. Yeah? Now, final words for this. The microbiological testing program. I've seen very creative ways to deal with this. It's something that I call an active program. And I'm going to give you an example. Please, this is not a guideline. I'm not giving you consultants, just giving you an example of something that I saw that I thought was really good. There was a company who have a swabbing program. In the swabbing program, they were only swabbing for total plate count. Why? Because they wanted to assess, you know, the efficiency of the cleaning practices. And they said threshold, but different threshold for equipment, food contact, non-food contact, etc. And when he, when any threshold was exceeded, they have what I what I call an ally program. They clean, retest, but they also, together with the retest for total plate count, they were testing for E. coli, Salmonella, and Listeria. Why? This is just mathematics, statistics. If I have if I have a high account of total plate count, that increases chances that maybe in all those bacteria, you know, detected in that you know analysis, there could be. E. coli, Salmonella, or Listeria. So they weren't doing a nice program for this purpose, an active program re based on reacting when they have, you know, um, thresholds exceeded for total plate count. First, intensive, you know, going over a specific pathogen, you know, testing, and they also were increasing, you know, the swabbings in those areas or equipment. Yes, if I have one bad result, maybe the next one will be bad. So instead of being, you know, for example, swabbing monthly, they were increasing the sample to weekly, at least three weeks. And if no issues, then they go back to the original plan. Think about this. That is what I call a live, you know, microbiological testing program that reacts depending, you know, a base testing program defined, you know, for this purpose. Okay, uh, the next one is very unusual that applies where food safety related testing is being done in house, personal comments, microbiological lab testing in house. In other words, you're potentially growing microbes in your own, in your own compound. Uh, kind of risky. Anyway, there should be a laboratory quality assurance manual with validated testing methods and protocols, evidence of training related to sample collection and testing pro protocols and relevant records of results. Yeah, this is a very loaded question. So if you have a microbiological lab in your operation, uh, we are going to spend a long time analyzing, you know, all the potential risks and the techniques, the method that you're using for testing. And something very important, how do you deal with the growing media? I mean, how do you dispose them? Yeah, so in theory, you could be growing Listeria, Salmonella, E. coli in a food manufacturing company. Scary. Okay, the last slides make reference to very simple um, documents that you're going to be required. The first one, do you remember that currently in version 2.1, we have a, a specific question about records almost at the end of the checklist related with the checking of temperature of the shipping trucks? Well, now there's a new question, the SOP to do that. Hey, folks, should be a brief SOP explaining, you know, that they use, they should use, for, for example, a handheld thermometer, walk inside of the reefer, measure temperature, and record it, yeah? 
Uh, the next one. Do you remember that we have the question about uh, um, about the checking of the cleanliness of the, check, the uh, shipping trucks? Well, now the standard add the question about a specific SOP for that instruction in how to do that. And I have a question. And it is only for growing pathogens in your lab. Will not apply for ATP or other form of testing that do not grow pathogens. Correct? I think you're right. Let me double check. Mm -hmm. You know what? Hmm. It's open. This is not just targeting microbiological. It's food safety related testing being done in house. Now, uh, well, ATP, ATP is other thing. It's not a lab. And sorry, this not apply for ATP. This is, you know, this is targeting a lab where you use growing medias to potentially grow microbes. So how you do a test, for example, for Listeria, you pull a sample, you put that sample in a growing media, yeah? And uh, then you see if there's presses or not based on multiplication, you let them incubate for a several days, depending on the technique that you're using, and then you check if there's presence or not of that pathogen. Okay, uh, yeah, good question, Anne. Yeah, but ATP is out of this deal. Yeah, this is a laboratory, growing media, so you should have that in mind, yeah? I struggle with this excessive for small frame not growing pathogen. Yeah, I know. The thing is, you know, with all this type of testing, you know, rise your budget for microbiological testing. Yeah. Don't forget something, folks. I'm the messenger, not the one who wrote this. Now, I have to admit that I agree with a lot of this. I would like to be more free to decide about the testing frequency. But well. HACCP, only one new question. You remember the question about the flow diagram? The new question is just someone must review and sign off, you know, the flow diagram of the process, the HACCP coordinator. That's all. So you need to grab your flow diagram of the process, walk through the facility, through the process to assure that it match with the reality of your process and sign the, and put your signature and date in the flow diagram or in an or in a parallel log. That's enough. Yeah. And that's the only new question in the uh, in the HACCP section. Yeah, because HACCP has not changed. HACCP is based in codex. I'm going to st stop a little before go over the new things in the preventive control module to see if there's any question. Mm, okay, you always talk about the ATP, so not apply for the ATP, the thing about the in-house lab, laboratory. Okay, let's move over the preventive controls. Well, for the people who have been working with the preventive controls and no requirements, uh, I like to think as co uh, has a codec with asteroids, with steroids. Yeah, there's a lot of similarities in between the HACCP module and the preventive control module. The main difference are in the terms used in this module reflect those are, that are used in the preventive control rule. Along with the same idea, the training for this module will only detail questions that are specific to the preventive control module. For example, product description. Product description is exactly the same requirement for HACCP and for the preventive control. So with one document, you kill to birds, yeah? And you know, along that, there's a lot of other similarities, yeah? Uh, the flow diagram of the process, pro description, etc. Okay, so we're going to check only the difference, but as an advice, I've seen very smart program where they merge HACCP with preventive consoles, you know, in only one problem to avoid redundancy. Okay, 7204, do process preventive control have critical limits and other preventive control have parameters, values and targets were relevant, supported by relevant validation documentation. So this is like a has some critical control point. For the preventive controls, you need to set critical limits and you need to back up those critical limits, you know, with relevant validation documentation, regulations, you know, uh, good reputation studies or your own validation program, yeah? Are the documents that show validation work for the process preventive controls and that, and was this validation work performed by or overseen by a preventive control qualified individual? 
So in this case, we're looking for evidence that the person, you know, that did all the validation for the preventive controls has, is competent. Yeah. So we expect to see a preventive call, controls certificate. Uh, the validation work could include peer review, scientific literature, legislative documentation, trade association guidance, implant, implant observation and testing, or a mix of them. Yeah. And where useful and relevant, other preventive control types like san sanitation preventive control should be supported by validation work dated between 90 days of starting produce, production. Do preventive control plans, charts, and RSOPs indicate that specific responsibilities has been assigned for the monitoring, recording, and corrective action implemented? So this is SOP explaining, you know, how to monitor the, the classic SOP explaining how to monitor the preventive control and who is responsible of the monitoring, the recording, and the corrective action. Usually the same person, yeah? Again, use positions instead of names, because if you let them go or they quit, yeah, you're going to need to change your document and don't forget that you need you, you need to follow the document control requirements of Primo GFS. So you're going to generate a new revision of that SOP. Yeah. Uh, other preventive controls, you know, review it when operational changes are made, process, equipment, ingredients, and at least once every three years. Why this question is here? Because in the HESA program, according to Prime GFS, you need to update when there's changes in the process, the equipment, new products, or at least once a year. But in the case of the preventive control, they extend that period instead of once a year to three years. But the purpose is exactly the same. Yeah. The only thing that changes is the time frame for the review. Uh, the next one is a verbal inter interview with the worker responsible responsible of the, pre the preventive controls, you know, operation, the person responsible of the monitoring of those preventive controls. Oh, uh, the person should know, uh, this is not, you know, you have three seconds to explain me, you know, what is written in the law. No, 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 no. This is just to talk, you know, usually, you know, the guy is under stress, is out there with a, you know, clean board in front of him, the manager's behind him. It's just, hey, what are you doing? How you do this? Do you understand which is the purpose of it? That's the key, understanding which is the purpose of what he or she is monitoring, yeah? And also, the interview, you know, include, you know, a uh, question about the specific SOP for the monitoring of this or this, you know, uh, preventive controls, you know, who are the responsibility of that person, yeah? And that's all, folks. This is just an update training, yeah? So even that, you know, I'm, I gave you the most important change in the standard, but as I told you before, I highly recommend to do your own review, yeah? To check for a specific details. And it's very easy to catch these changes. Why? Because everything that is new in the standard is highlighted in red uh, in the interpretation guidelines. So not complicated to catch easily, visually, you know, those changes.